Come on in and find a seat. Grab your coffee from the hallway. Find a place to seat to sit. We're so thankful that you could be here this morning, and we want to welcome you, especially if you're our, a guest here this morning. If this is your first time being here or your first time in a long time, uh, we hope and pray that this will not be your last, that you'll continue to join us in worship and praise of our God. We're so thankful uh, for our guests who are here this morning. If that is you, there's a little QR code in the seat right in front of you, and if you take out your phone and scan that, um, it'll bring up just a little form where we can kind of get to, get to know you. And uh, as a gift for filling out that form and letting us know that you are here, we'd like to send you a coupon to, for a free cup of coffee at Crazy Love Coffee House. So guests, uh, welcome this morning. Thank you for being here with us. I do have a few announcements for us this morning for the church life and what's happening at LBC next uh, Sunday, the 26th. Um, we are going to have new life stage classes, and in Adult 1, uh, Pastor Josh is going to be doing Discipling Another Believer. Adult 2 is going to continue their series of Getting to the Heart of uh, Parenting with Pastor Brian, and then A3 is going to begin uh, a new study called Intro to Bible Doctrines by Clark McCauley, and so that's all happening next week during our Life Stage Hour. That's at 9.30 a.m., and it's a great uh, chance for you to uh, get plugged in, get connected with other people, and learn and grow in God's Word together. Then, of course, uh, we have coming up in March our Spring uh, emphasis, Missions Emphasis Weekend, and that's happening on, it begins on Saturday, March 11th, and goes through that Sunday. Um, so make sure that you save the date for that weekend, that you block out the early morning of Saturday uh, into the afternoon a little bit, and uh, make sure that you join us for that day. And then, of course, uh, we're going to be welcoming uh, two new church planters, uh, listening to their ministry presentations. Uh, these are church planters in Utah, in, in the Salt Lake uh, Valley area. And so we're looking forward to that time together. Make sure that you uh, save that date and mark out that time on your calendar. We're going to transition now, and we're going to talk about why we have gathered here this morning. And the theme of our gathering is this theme, that's the faithful love of our Lord. And our call to worship this morning is from Psalm 25. The psalmist writes these words, Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. It's an amazing statement. All of the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness. Some of you might be like, Mark, all the paths of the Lord? My path kind of looks like maybe the valley of the shadow of death. I don't know what's happening in your life. Maybe your path doesn't look like peace. It doesn't look bright and sunny. But the scripture says, that all the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness. It doesn't mean it will always be bright and sunny, but it means that wherever God takes you, wherever He leads you, He will be with you always. And His love will surround you like a shield. And He will never leave you or forsake you. And so this morning, we're going to rejoice in God's faithful, steadfast love for us. Would you pray with me? Father, we come before you. We thank you that you never leave us or forsake us. That you promise to surround us with your love. You have in many ways and at many times upheld us through trial 
You have led us through the valley of the shadow of death, and we have learned that you are faithful, that you're with us, that your rod and staff comforts us. And so, Father, we thank you that even at times when we are faithless, you remain faithful. And we rejoice in that love that will not let us go. We give you thanks in the name of Jesus who has purchased this for us and has brought us into your family as children of you. We give thanks for him and we rejoice in his name. And I pray these things in his name. Amen. Let's all stand together and we'll begin singing of God's love for us. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Let's sing together. separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Let's sing together, God is for us. We won't fear the battle, we won't fear the night, we will walk the valley with you by our side.
We'd like to introduce to you this morning a brand new song entitled Christ, Our Hope in Life and Death. And uh, the team and I are going to sing it for you and then we'll ask you to join us as we sing together. our hope in life and death. Christ alone, Christ alone, what is our only confidence? That our souls to Him belong, who holds our days within His hand. What comes apart from His command, and what will keep us to on that first stanza again. to the end. 
We are going to be having our missions conference, and we have told you that uh, as we have that conference, we're going to be taking a special offering. Of course, we'll be uh, giving a uh, love offering to the speakers, uh, the church planners that will be with us. But we're also raising money to help with a building project there as one of the churches seeks to expand. And so let me encourage you to begin to pray in reference to that. And this morning we have a short video uh, from uh, the pastor there just to tell you a little bit more about the project. Uh, and it's a, a, it's a message directly to our church. So let's watch it right now. Greetings from Gospel Hope Church in Riverton, Utah. I'm Danny Brooks, one of three pastors here at Gospel Hope. Brothers and sisters, how we thank God in every remembrance of you. These are the words that the Apostle Paul first wrote to the Philippians 2,000 years ago, but they're appropriate for us as we consider our relationship with you. Paul goes on to say, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. We feel that way about Lebanon Baptist. And through the plant camp teams that you've sent out, through the other personal visits, through financial gifts to us, to our family personally, as well as Gospel Hope, you truly have partnered with us in the gospel. It would be difficult for me to express on behalf of Gospel Hope the depth of joy we had in hearing that Lebanon Baptist is collecting an offering to help us with our building program. So Josh Rowland tells us that you all have seen the longer video about this project, but let me highlight just a couple of key components. We're building a much needed 5,000 square foot addition that is primarily discipleship space. We'll pave out the rest of our two acre lot, try to do some additional work on existing restrooms and the kitchen, and hopefully add a good outdoor area for children's ministry. All of that totals around $2 million. Now, we've been able to save some cash of a little over $300,000, we think, at this point. And uh, the bank is willing to loan us $1.25 in that neighborhood. But if you do the quick math, you can see that leaves us short of completing the entire project. 
So we'll likely build in phases. We're going to go as far as the Lord providentially allows us to go with the funds that we have on hand, but your gift will certainly help us to move closer to the full goal. So we thank you, and we pray with you that God would show you exactly what his desire is, and we trust the Holy Spirit to lead and make that clear. So may God richly bless you, even as he is richly blessing us through you. We love you all, and thank you, and praise God for your partnership as we build for the gospel. So you begin to pray about how you can be a part of that offering that we'll be taking March the 11th and the 12th. Uh, many of you know our church has uh, some focus areas. We're trying to help get the gospel planted in one of the neediest parts of the United States, and that's the Salt Lake Valley. And here are, uh, we've seen a number of churches planted there, but would love for you to participate in that offering. Many of you know another one of our areas, of course, in Southeast Asia. Uh, it's exciting. I'm not sure if you caught them here yet, but uh, Jamie, uh, our uh, missionary to Southeast Asia, is here for just a really uh, short trip. Jamie, where are you at? There he is. He's right over here. So if you didn't know he's here, he's here for a quick trip because a church wanted him to come and report. And so he flew back. So if you uh, get a chance to, he's here for a couple of weeks or a few weeks. He's going to report to our church on March the 5th in the evening and give us kind of a, a new report. And then he'll be heading out quickly after that. But uh, Jamie, it's so excited, exciting to have you here and uh, trust uh, you'll uh, get to connect with him. He uh, probably doesn't have a ton of time, but I know a lot of you want to get some time with him. But let me encourage you, if you can catch him this morning, to say hello and, and tell him how you're praying for him. Join me as I pray uh, for this endeavor. Lord, as our church seeks to prepare for this missions conference, I ask that you would use March 11th and 12th to once again reignite our hearts to think beyond our own facility and beyond our own church, that we would seek to expand the gospel as you commanded us to the ends of the world. Lord, I thank you for bringing Jamie back here safely. I thank you for his family, even as I read their report this past week, and how you are just continuing to uh, just expand their ministry. I think of the three years that they have now been there. Lord, we thank you for the, the accomplishments that have uh, happened all by your divine grace. And Lord, I ask that you would further the work there. And then in Utah, Lord, would you provide the remaining funds that are needed to help this, uh, this vital church in Riverton, Utah, be able to expand and be able to disciple in that area. Uh, may uh, you allow our church to be a true blessing to that church. And then, Lord, today, Lord, would you encourage our hearts? Would you once again give us a new vision of life on this planet while we wait for your second coming? Uh, Lord, allow your word to have deep root into our lives. Allow our singing, join our hearts together as we celebrate God's steadfast love. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. John writes in 1 John 4, he says, In this, the love of God was manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, the turning away of God's wrath for our sins. If you want to know where the love of God is most clearly displayed, it is displayed in the cross of Jesus Christ. Let's all stand together and sing, Oh, praise the name. Yeah, 
is how deep the Father's love for us, this love that he showed in giving us his only son. Let's sing together. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure how great the pain of searing loss the father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory Behold the man upon the cross, I sit upon his shoulders, ashamed I hear my mocking voice, call out among the scoffers, it was my sin.
time we'd like to dismiss our kids k4 through the second grade out the back doors parents if you're new to our gathering you can pick them up down this hallway thank you, you can be seated this morning let me invite you to turn in your bibles to john 21 now some of you that comes as a surprise to you it's not romans well this morning i am pivoting okay uh Many of you know that this past week I was at a conference uh, speaking in South Carolina. And uh, I had high plans to uh, spend a lot of time in Romans studying over my commentaries. In fact, if you would have seen my trunk, I had like a stack of commentaries, and, uh, which I called my friends who I was going to talk to over the course of the week and study and had a little bit of time right when I got there. However, I was kind of scheduled out the rest of the week. And I was staying at my parents' house there in the evenings and didn't even get home till sometimes after, even every night till after nine. And they wanted to chat with me each evening. And so, uh, so I didn't get the time that I wanted to spend and study this week. And the next section of Romans, the next two verses are just incredible. They're a key in the book. So I wanted some more time. So what I'm going to do this morning is I'm going to speak on the topic that I spoke on at the conference. And of course the theme was God's steadfast love. And what we're going to look at this morning, the scene that I'm going to read to you in just a moment, is an incredible picture of God's steadfast love toward us. Of course, the Gospel of John. It was written by the Apostle John, one of Jesus' disciples. We know the purpose of the book. John wrote it to the world in order that you would believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the, the Christos, the Christ. That you would believe that Jesus is none other than the Son of God and that you would believe on him and as a result of it, you would have life. Not just life, but abundant life. And what John has done, because we're in John 21, what he's done over the first 20 chapters is he has continued to bring witnesses to the stand. He has brought discourses that Jesus taught. He's brought certain events and miracles, all in many ways as evidence to the fact that you need to give your life to Jesus Christ and to serve him with all your hearts, souls, and minds. In John 21, he brings us to what many have called the epilogue. John 1 is the prologue. John 21 is the epilogue. And in this epilogue, what Jesus does is he basically shepherds his disciples back to the mission that God had called them to live out. The setting of the John 21 is the shore of the Sea of Galilee. I'm taking a group to Israel in just, uh, really, just about three weeks. And one of the places we'll visit while we're there is a place called the Church of the Primacy of Peter. And it's built on a location that many people believe would have been around the area that the events of this particular chapter occurred. So I'm going to read you the chapter, and would you just follow along and really picture this in your mind. John 21, I'm going to read the entire chapter and uh, allow this beautiful story to impact you this morning. Listen to what it says. 
After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana of Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into a boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it. And now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and he threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, about a hundred yards off. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And all they were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and so with the fish. Now this was the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. After saying this, he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who had leaned back against him during the supper and had said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. So the same spread abroad among the brothers that, his disciple, that this disciple was not to die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die, but if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things. And we know that his testimony is true. Now there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Would you pray with me? Father, as we uncover this text, as we imagine this story, would you allow it to impact our lives this morning in a special way? I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I've told you many times that it was during my high school years that I finally chose to follow Jesus Christ. 
However, my discipleship was filled with and has continued to be filled with ups and downs. I've wanted to serve him. I've fallen. I've gotten back up. And all of you in this room, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you truly have chosen to follow Jesus Christ, your life as well has been full of ups and downs. Sometimes following him, sometimes getting off track. We all do and we all mess up. Thankfully, we have a God who is filled with steadfast love. And what he is so gracious to do is he continues to shepherd us back onto the mission that he's called us to live out. Disciples of Jesus, all of you, have a tendency of getting distracted by other things. Remember that uh, uh, cartoon a number of years ago called Up? Okay, there was this uh, cartoon Disney show and, and basically there was this uh, dog in it. And any time the dog heard what? Squirrel. It would get distracted. And many of you who have dogs, as soon as they see a squirrel or a deer, pff, their minds are set. You know what we are so often like? We are so often people that we're just living life and all of a sudden something distracts us. It may not be a squirrel or a deer, but it's sin. It's the affairs of this life. And we get distracted from living out the mission that God has called us to live. In our text this morning, what we're going to see is this. Jesus lovingly will direct you, he directs his disciples back on mission. He does that. And he's going to do it with you if you are his child. He graciously continues to do this in our life. The disciple who is kind of the focus of this particular chapter is none other than Peter. And what he does in these verses of John 21 is he leads Peter back to serve him, back on the pathway of what he called him to do. And in this text, what we see is four beautiful reminders that Jesus gives to his disciples about serving him. And the first is this, Jesus reminds us at times of his great power. Okay, the text gives us a little bit of a background. Okay, Uh, here they are, they're at the Sea of Tiberias, okay? Know that the person who's writing this is an eyewitness. John the Apostle, who you are reading his words, was there. He's painting the picture for you. And in verse 1, listen to what it says again. It says, after Jesus, after this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, And he revealed himself in this way. So here they are. They're at a lake. It's a beautiful lake. And seven of Jesus' disciples are there. And Peter shouts out a plan to the other disciples. Listen to what it says in verse 3. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. Okay, you guys can see that being said by numbers of men in this room. Okay, Andy Miles for one of them, okay, T.J. Turner, uh, uh, Joe McVicker, I'm going fishing, okay, and what does the disciples do? We're going with you. We're going to jump in the boat and let's go. Now, what's going on here? Some have suggested that Peter was going back to his former profession. Okay, Jesus had commissioned them. He had resurrected from the grave. He had displayed his power. And now Peter, what is he doing? Is he going back to fishing? Some people have suggested that maybe Peter, during this little period of time, was just kind of filling time until the Holy Spirit, as Jesus said, the Holy Spirit's going to come and empower you. And he's just kind of killing time until the Spirit descends and so he probably thought, hey, we got to eat, so let's, we might as well spend our time fishing. Okay. What's going on here? I possibly think that it's probably a mix of the two. They often, what they would do is they would fish at night so that they could sell their fish in the morning market. We're told in the text that they didn't catch anything that night. And the sun was now rising over the Golan Heights. 
and Jesus shows up on the scene. This is Jesus' third visit to them as a group. And what he does here is he begins to once again manifest his power to them. He calls out to them from shore and he asks them, look what it says in verse 5. He says, Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? Of course, the way I would have said it is, how's the luck? Okay, because I'm not God, okay? How's the luck? And of course, they respond, no, we haven't caught anything. And what does he do? He tells them, hey, cast your net on the right side. What do they do? They cast it and they start pulling in this massive load of fish. Now, as they started to do this, no doubt it triggered a memory. Now, I'm not going to do it this morning, but if you were to turn to Luke chapter 5 and read verses 1 through 11, you'll read a story about how the apostle Peter, for a time, had started following Jesus. Jesus had started his earthly ministry, and Peter was following him, but what he would do is he would often go back to fishing. Follow Jesus for a little bit, go back to fishing. Follow Jesus a little bit, go back to fishing, and Jesus one day shows up on the scene in Luke 5, and he basically commandeers his boat. He says, hey, I want to teach from your boat today. And he he gets in his boat, and he begins to teach, and Peter had fished all night long and had caught nothing. And after Jesus is done teaching, he says, hey, Peter, launch out into the deep, and let's throw the nets in. And now, here they are. They had spent all night, no fish. Peter doesn't want to obey, but he says, Nevertheless, at your command, I'm going to do it. And he throws the net in. And if you remember the story, he pulls in this massive load of fish. And it was there that Peter does this. He repents. He says, yeah, I know I've gone back and forth. I followed you for a time, and then I've gone back to my own profession. And he says, he repents, and he says, I'm an unclean man. And then the text ends with this. It basically says, then Peter left all and followed him. It was almost as if he said, finally, God, everything's for you. But now, after Jesus died and rose again, what's Peter back at? He's fishing again. Maybe he's like wavering, what am I going to do here? How am I going to move forward? What does God do? He reminds Peter, guess what? I have all power. I am the master of the universe. If you are going to serve in any way, you need me. You need to follow my plan for your life. He demonstrates his incredible power. Not only did he have power over all the fish, I mean, here was the the, the very person that overcame death. Standing in front of them. He manifests his power. Now notice the Apostle John's discernment. When it came to the disciples, John was the guy who was aware of everything. And immediately, he's the one who shows his perception. He says, guess what? That's the Lord. So he shows his perception, but Peter, you know what he shows? His decisiveness. He was like, that's the Lord? Putting my coat on? I'm diving in. And I I mentioned even when I was preaching, I've always wanted to do that. I wanted to be on a boat and just dive into the Sea of Galilee. Maybe I'll do it this year. I'm not sure. It could be pretty cold. uh, But, and he swims, the Bible says, 100 yards to shore. I'm looking at a number of Jesus' disciples in this room. But, I know, if you're like me, there are times that you get distracted. You go back to your status quo of living life your way. You begin to put your priorities over God's priorities. Sometimes it may be sin that you get distracted by and you get into and you get caught in it. And it, 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 it starts to have dominion over you. Sometimes it could be just weights. They may not be sin, but they're distractions. And you just go back to them and start living for them. And what 
God sometimes will do in your life, he does it with Peter, he'll remind you that he has all power. He can do whatever he wants in the kingdoms of men. He is the master over everything. And that's what he does with Peter. He says, Peter, let me remind you. Whatever you do, if you're going to have any success, it all depends on me. I'm the God of the universe. So you need to recommit your life to do my bidding. In fact, it was not far from here. Some people don't realize this. But the Great Commission, which is in Matthew 28... Sometimes people think that it happened in Jerusalem, which was a long way away. But Matthew 28, the Bible says, happened in Galilee. And it was probably sometime right around here that when Jesus gives that great commission, and you remember what he says at the beginning of the great commission? All power is given unto me in what? In heaven and in earth. They are looking at Jesus, and he could do whatever he wants, anytime he wants. He is the master of it all. And... and If you're a disciple of Jesus, why live for anything else but Jesus? Because he has all power. He's the one. And and God allows Peter to be reminded, he's the one. He's the one I need to give my life to. But Jesus not only reminds him of his power, but he also reminds him of his provision. Okay, first of all, how many fish? Jesus allows them to catch 153, and if you'll notice the text, it says large fish. I guarantee there was no small ones in the nets that day. Now, why did they count? Was it so that they could brag when they get to Capernaum later that day? Hey, yeah, you know the old record? 91? We, 153. Now, some people have said, is there any symbolism in this? I don't think so. I think the whole reason he gives us the number of 153, it's because of this. John never, ever forgot that number. I mean, maybe 10 years later, the disciples are all together, and one guy says, oh, yeah, remember after Jesus rose from the dead and we were at the shore and we caught like that 150 fish? And John says, no, it was 153 John is a guy who recorded, even at the beginning of the book of John, in John 1, when he first met Jesus, you remember what he said? He said this, I met him at about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. He never forgot the time he met Jesus. And here God provides 153 fish, okay? When they get to land, Jesus, not only that, now don't think that they're cooking the fish, that they brought in because what happens is this breakfast is already ready don't you like when breakfast is already ready breakfast was already done all they're getting to do is they're getting called down for it and so come on in and he provides breakfast look what it says in verse 12 and 13 it says Jesus said to them come and have breakfast now none of them of the disciples dared ask him who are you for they knew it was the Lord Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. And you you see what he starts to provide for them? Bread and what? Fish. Bread and fish. Had he ever done that before? Had he ever provided bread and fish to his disciples? If you remember, not far from where they're at right here on the Sea of Galilee, this shore, many months before, There was a huge crowd of 5,000 men, and there was not enough food. And, of course, Jesus tells his disciples, uh, hey, let's give them something to eat to test them. And they're like, we don't have anything. All we got is uh, five loaves and two fish. But what are they among so many? And what does Jesus do in the middle of the wilderness? He provides bread and fish for all of them to eat. And you know what he shows them? He shows them that he is none other than Yahweh God. Remember hundreds of years before when Israel was wandering in the wilderness and they needed food? What did God do? He provided manna in the wilderness. And in John chapter 6, Jesus shows them, guess who I am? I'm the one who can feed you in the wilderness. Not only that, he would say that he is the light of the world. What did the wilderness wanderers need? They needed light. He says, I'm your light. 
They needed water. You remember that? Remember what he tells the woman at the well? If you drink of me, you will live forever. I'm the one. And what Jesus is doing is he's showing that he is the ultimate provider. Maybe Peter thought, you know what, if I really start living for God, who's going to take care of me? Who's going to take care of my needs? You know, a lot of people think if they surrender their life to God and really do what God wants them to do, it's almost like shackles will come on and life becomes hard and rough. And um, let me tell you, following Jesus, there are going to be some rough roads But let me remind you that when you choose to follow Jesus Christ, he has ultimate provision. He will take care of all of your needs. Once again, not far from this location, he had preached the Sermon on the what? The Mound. And in the midst of the Sermon on the Mound, he said this, Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, or yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not life more than food and raiment. I remember the first time I was ever at uh, this location where the Sermon on the Mount happened, and I was having to give a challenge on the Sermon on the Mount to the group in our, uh, that were in Israel with me. And here I am, I'm talking about it, and the area that the Sea of Galilee is, is it's in this kind of almost like a wind tunnel, where because it's between Africa and Asia, all the bird, the migrating birds, they have to travel through this little area. They go through this little, you could say, wind tunnel. Millions and millions and millions of birds. And here I am, I'm teaching, and all of a sudden, I'm, I'm talking about this text, and some birds are all landing around me, around me. And I'm like, what does Jesus say? Consider the fowls of the air. <laughs> Consider the birds. I feed every one of them. And then I looked across the prairie and there's all these flowers growing up. He says, I clothe all the flowers. But you, you remember how he ends that section? He says, but seek first, what? The kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things shall be added unto you. So here Jesus, they're sitting by the shore. Not only has he manifested his power, But he's also manifested, I'm the ultimate provider. You remember the bread I fed you with many months ago? And the fish? Let me just remind you, I will take care of you, Peter. Live for me. Serve me. Do what I've called you to do. When it comes to following Jesus, don't worry about your provision. I guarantee there's some of you in this room that you are a follower of Jesus and you have become very anxious about how you're going to take care of your own needs. Let me tell you, seek first God's kingdom and he will take care of all of those things. He is. He's that type of provider. But not only does he remind them of his power and his provision, but he also reminds them of his great patience with us. Okay, what happens next in the story? Following the meal, Jesus begins to have a conversation with Peter. Look what it says in verse 15. It says this, When Peter had finished breakfast, or when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Now let me just, for a moment, paint a picture for you. Some people may not notice this, but it is something interesting in the text. A few verses before this, in verse 9, John mentions that the fire that Jesus had started was what type of fire? A charcoal fire. Now, when was the last time there was a charcoal fire in the book of John? It was during Jesus' trial. And when Peter is warming himself by a what? Charcoal fire. And what does he do? Three times. He denies Jesus. Now don't stretch this too far, but it is interesting as he paints this picture, it's the next time a charcoal fire shows up. And it's like, oh, Jesus has now set a charcoal fire. And as we know, Jesus had spoken to Peter since the time he betrayed him. 
after his resurrection and possibly restored him at that time. But many people see the dialogue that is to follow here as Peter's public restoration. God begins to show his patience and his steadfast love by seeking to affirm Peter by asking, he says this, do you love me more than these? Now, what do you think these are? What is he talking about there? Some people think that he's talking about, do you love me more than these other six disciples? Yeah, the sons of Zebedee, Nathaniel, do you love me more than these guys? It could be meaning that. Or is he saying, do you love me more than these guys love me? Had he ever boasted about that? Remember he had said, hey, if all the other guys leave you, I'm not going to leave you. Maybe he's reminding them about that. Or possibly, he says this, do you love me more than these? And he points down, and if you look at the story, after they brought in the 153 fish, Jesus particularly asked Peter, to bring up some of the fish. And maybe Jesus is this, do you love me more than these? And he's basically talking about his profession. Are you going to just live for these fish and live for this job that you've done? I lean toward it's either the fish or do you love me more than these other disciples? But really, what's really the point here? Asking Peter if he loves him three times is establishing a point. Peter had denied Jesus three times. Clearly. I don't know this man. In fact, at one point he cursed about it. Jesus now takes Peter and affirms, has him affirm his love three times. It's almost like Jesus is doing this. Hey, Peter. And and Jesus knew everything about Peter. He knows everything about you. He knows your heart. He knows what you really believe. I think he's just helping Peter once again reaffirm, say it again, Peter. You know I love you. You know I love you. You know I love you. Some have focused on the different Greek words that underlie love, the difference of Uh, agape and phileo, saying that Peter couldn't affirm the stronger of those loves. I don't think that's the point. Because in the context, Jesus uses different Greek words for love, for sheep, for knowing, for feeding, for tending. Jesus knew Peter had failed and that others knew that he failed. But Jesus is basically helping him. Hey, he's reaffirming him. He's having, he's reiterating to him his calling in his life. Okay, why am I telling you this? Because if you are a follower of Jesus, there are going to be numbers of times in your spiritual life that you are going to deny Jesus because of your own sin and your own fear. You're going to play the role of Peter way too often. And you're going to come to church on Sundays and it's going to be like God's warmed a charcoal fire for you. And you're going to remember, oh yeah, I did that this past week. And you know what God wants to do? And oftentimes I have to do this on Sunday morning. As we're singing the songs together, I'm reminding God. and He's asking me, hey, do you love me, Brian? Do you love me? Do you truly love me? And sometimes I'm up on this front row and I'm reminding the Lord, God, you know me. You know I love you. And I'm going to have to reaffirm it again. And sometimes it's good to do it in a group of people. Isn't it? God is patient with you. And sometime or another, if you're sitting here today, I know there are a bunch of you who you've lived, there's been times when you've been a whole lot more passionate for the Lord and you've got off track, you've gone back to fishing, you've started worrying about all of life or maybe some sin or some area of your life have gotten you entangled and you are just, you need to get restored again. And Jesus comes to you in a loving way and says, hey, let me ask you again, do you love me? And he knew that Peter loved him, but he wanted, Peter, then you say it, say it. Say it. 
That's our God. In our service for Jesus, we are all going to fail miserably like Peter. I can tell you, a just man falls seven times and riseth up again. And just so you know, it doesn't mean you can only fall seven times. He's using that seven as the number of completion. I'm the guy who's like, I need the 70 times seven, okay? The steps of a good man are what? Ordered by the Lord, though he what? Fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hands. You know what some of you may need to do this morning? Jesus may be coming to you and say, hey, do you love me? And you need to say to him, you know everything about me, God. And you know I love you. And forgive me of of what I've done. And come back to him. See him remind you of his power. See him remind you of his provision. See you remind you of his patience. But then also the final point is this. Jesus reminds Peter of his plan. In the conversation, Jesus first reminds Peter three different times of what he called him to do. Okay, what was it? Okay, you can talk to me. He tells him to what? Feed what? Feed my sheep. Now, what was Peter? Was he a, was he a shepherd? He was a what? Fisherman. But God had a different plan for him. You're not going to catch fish. You're going to tend sheep. And he was particularly talking about people. And God was calling Peter to a special area of ministry. In fact, what would he do? He would be the guy who would preach the incredible message of Pentecost just a few weeks after this. And he would be the one who opened the gospel to the Jews who had crucified Jesus. And he would tell them about Jesus. And all these people would come into God's family and they would need to be shepherded because the chief shepherd is going to be in heaven and he's going to need under shepherds to do it. Not only that, Peter would be the very guy who would open the gospel to the Gentiles with Cornelius. And God would need Peter to give his life and devote his life to the people of Jesus Christ. Did you know that sometimes God has special callings on individuals? He had a special calling on Peter. I believe that God had a special calling on me when I was in high school. After I had gotten right with the Lord, um, I went on a New York City mission trip. And while I was there, I saw, I remember being at the top of the World Trade Center and just looking at all the lights and looking at all the people that were there. And I was like, man, this world is dying and going to hell without the message of Jesus. And a verse that became very dear to me was this, for though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid a hold of me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. And I began to have this inner sense that I needed to be, to give my life to preaching and to God's people. Uh, One guy said this, a man who has within him the Holy Spirit's inspiration calling him to preach cannot help it. He must preach. As fire within his bones, so will that influence be. Friends may check him, foes criticize him, despise or sneer at him. The man is indomitable. I think it no more possible to stop a man from preaching than to stay some mighty river by seeking in an infant's cup to catch the rushing torrent. The man has been touched of God, who shall stop him? The man has been moved of heaven, who shall impede him? And when a man does speak as the Spirit gives him utterance, he shall feel a joy akin to that of heaven. And when he is there, he wishes once more to be preaching. You know what, God began to deal in my heart, and maybe God in this room is working on some of you. Maybe there's some men in this room that God has given you an internal desire for the work of of shepherding the flock. That's one of the things we're trying to continue to develop in our church. I mean, know that pastors don't just have to give vocationally that way. Peter, I mean, the apostle Paul, not only was he a pastor, you could say apostle, he was also a tent maker. But God gives an internal desire for the work, and then it ultimately is externally confirmed through the church body. 
But Peter had a calling, and God's calling on him was this, feed my sheep. And what did he do? He released his hand and says, God, that's what you want me to do. Did you know that all of you, whether uh, some of you may have that calling on your life, but all of you have been called to give your life to him and serve in the area of making disciples, all of you. When Jesus gave the Great Commission in Matthew 28, it wasn't just to the 12 apostles. Read Matthew 28. There was a huge crowd there. And all of them were commanded to make disciples. And God here is reminding you that he has a plan for your life. And it's not simply to be a nurse, to be a teacher, to be a businessman. Those are great things, but those are simply tools for you to do your main job. And your main job is this, follow him and make disciples, and you use your job to do your mission, and your mission is to get the gospel out, and what Jesus has to do with Peter, he has to remind him, let me remind you what you're supposed to be doing with your life, feed my sheep, feed my sheep, feed my sheep, and you know what he just says next, follow me, follow me, follow me. Now, what do we like to do? We get diverted, You want me to do that? But all of a sudden, what do we like to do? We like to think, but what about this person? What about that person? It's here that you know what Jesus does? He tells Peter as he serves them, it's going to be pretty hard for you, Peter. And he tells them that one day he is going to have to stretch out his hands. And the text says that it's signified by what death he would die. And by tradition, what many people believe is that Peter Ultimately, what Jesus is doing is he's telling him that he is going to have to die. I mean, I've I've thought about this story. This is almost like going into a doctor's office. And as the doctor tells you this, he gives you a death sentence. Here the great physician is giving Peter a death sentence. He's saying, hey, Peter, guess what? You're going to die. But what I want you to do is this. I want you to follow me. Follow me. Even though it's going to be hard, even though it's going to be difficult, I want you to keep taking each step in front of you and follow me. And Peter, of course, like you and me, gets a little distracted. I mean, he knew about this the rest of his life. In fact, when he would write 2 Peter Listen to what this verse says. He would say this, knowing that shortly I must put off my tabernacle even as the Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. He he kept that in his mind. I know I'm going to die. God's already given me my death sentence. But I'm going to keep following him. But what does Peter do? He says, hey, but Jesus, what about John? I mean, isn't that what we do? We immediately, when God gives a command to us, we think of, hey, we get distracted by other people. He says, what's going to happen to that guy, John, John the Apostle, whom you, uh, he leaned against your breast at the meal? And of course, John, who's writing this, has to clear up something here because uh, Jesus said something at that point that he says, if, if John remains until I come again, that doesn't matter for you, Peter. Don't be focused about what other people are doing. He basically says this, you, Peter, you follow me. And all of you in this room, don't be so concerned about what God wants for Brian's life or for the other person next to you or the person on the other side of the church. What Jesus wants is this. He wants you to follow him. That's your focus. That's the one you need to keep your eyes behind. And so Peter gets clarified, but then one last part of his plan Did you notice that little phrase? Until I what? Come. Did you catch that? Here we are, 2023, 2,000 years since Jesus really resurrected and ascended. But what did Jesus say? He says what? I'm coming what? Back. Have you forgot about that? Have you forgot that he could come back at any time? And I will join some of the writers of the epistles by saying, Maranatha, even so, Lord Jesus, quickly come. Aren't you ready to go if you're a believer? 
I mean, I would much rather be reunited. We, we deal with so much junk on this planet. But God knows about it. He knows our frame, but he wants us to do this. He's, he's tearing his coming so more would come in and that you and I could get involved in the work and that we could be busy about it. Let's get involved in God's work. So in our text, what happens is this. Jesus lovingly directs his disciples back on mission. I'm looking at some of you this morning, and maybe you've gotten distracted from living what God has called you to live out. If you're really a follower of Jesus, if he has called you into his family, your whole life is to be about following him, using whatever you do. But you know what we do? We just get distracted. We go back to our own plans. We go back to our own fishing. We get distracted by our own sin. But what does God graciously do? He may be calling to you this morning from the shore. Hey, calling your name. He may show you, hey, I'm the one who has all power. I'll take care of you. I have all provision. In fact, I want to restore you. Say it. Say it, I love you, Lord, forgive me. And then he's coming to you this morning and said, hey, let's get back to work. Feed my sheep, follow me. That's our hesed, steadfast, loving God. And I'll tell you, if you know him, he keeps doing it. I can't tell you how many times he's done it with me. Now, I'll say this, if he's not doing that with you, if there's never been a point that he really gets you back on target, could it be that maybe you're not his child and you need to, for the first time, go to him and ask him to be your savior and believe on him and then he'll begin to do that continually with you. Some of you may need to go to him for the first time. But some of you this morning need to reaffirm your love because of his steadfast love for you. Let's pray. Dear Father, Lord, would you take this text and would you minister to our hearts in whatever way you see fit? With your heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're you're here today and you would say this, you'd say, Pastor Brian, I needed this message because I'm kind of like Peter. I've gotten distracted from the mission of my life. Maybe it was sin. Maybe it was just a distraction. But you know what? This morning, God showed up at my lake. And he used what you said in this text to begin to pull me home. And you'd say, God, you'd say, Pastor Brian, God is doing something. And I need to do some business with him here at the end of this service. If that's you and you'd say, Pastor Brian, that's what God's doing in me. And just as a testimony of that, you'd say, with everyone's heads bowed and eyes closed, say, raise your hand and say, that's what God's doing right now in my life. Is that someone in in this room? Okay. Talk to him right now. Talk to him right now. Praise the Lord for that. Is there anyone in this room who would say, Pastor Brian, uh, I don't know if I was to die that I'd go to heaven. I don't have him continually coming to me and calling me to live for him. Uh, I feel like I'm, I, I've never really become a follower of Jesus, but I'm very interested in that. And you'd say, Pastor Brian, would you pray that I would take the next step of investigating that? And you'd say, I, I think I need to begin a relationship with God. If that's you with, with Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. You say, God's working in my heart about that. If that's you, would you just notify me by just raising your hand for just a moment? Say, that's me. God's working in my life. I'd love to be able to talk to you at some point. Whatever God's doing in your life right now, this is what I'm asking you to do, that you would do some business with the Lord right now. Would you take the quietness of this moment and you talk to him And use this special time to maybe get right with him. You pray right now. 
Dear Father, I don't know what you were trying to do this morning, but I ask that you would allow your steadfast love to be seen today through this John 21 text. And Lord, if there are any Peters in this room who've gone back to fishing, Lord, would you get us back to feeding sheep? And Lord, would you continue to lovingly direct us back onto the path of service? I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being here today. Of course, I think they gave you most of the announcements at the beginning. Uh, just so you're aware, uh, this is fall break for a, a number of school systems. So because of that, there is no Wednesday night events this week. There may be a prayer meeting. Uh, Pastor Hester, are you going to be continuing the online prayer meeting? So when you get the online prayer update, let me encourage you to jump on to the online prayer meeting. And then uh, I believe that is all of our announcements. So thank you for being here today. I trust you'll have an incredible week. Let me close our service with prayer. Now, Father, I just ask that you would do amazing things through our church people this week. Would you fill us with your spirit and would you help us to be in many ways like the Apostle Peter, sharing the gospel to the lost world. Now may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. And all the people of the Lord said, Amen. Have a good week.